my guest today is one that I waited to meet for a very long time. She is truly a representation of what she tells the world, Ella Mills. I was deeply unambitious. I really didn't know who I was or who I wanted to be. But out of what felt like nowhere, I became very, very ill. And I spent the rest of 2011 in bed or in nap hospitals. The doctors, they were, they were doing what they could do, but I, I just wanted them to fix it for me. I guess that's been like one of my biggest lessons in life is learning that that's not really how the world works. The vast majority of the food that you can buy, I mean, almost 70% of the calories we consume in this country come from ultra processed food. Probably quite harmful for our health. You go from illness, success, to business, to closures. Where are you now in life? Gently learning to kind of ride life's roller coaster a little bit better and nothing in life is Finite. Welcome back. Uh, I'm still at my friend's studio, Kate Dowdy. Thank you, Kate. You're wonderful. It's such a beautiful space and the light is so beautiful. Uh, and I hope you can grasp a few of the artworks around, which are so inspiring. And my guest today is one that I waited to meet for a very long time, uh, Ella Mills. If you uh, are from the United Kingdom. You would know Ella with her brand, Deliciously Ella, which uh, was incredibly and still is, but it became incredibly successful as I started to interact more with the UK early in the times when Salt for Happy was published. And uh, yeah, at the time she had an incredibly famous and pop popular podcast that she cleverly decided to, not, to, to put on hold for a while. Uh, and I wanted to be on that podcast. So now she is on mine. Ella is a very, very successful businesswoman. She is a, um, a, a beautiful brand for healthy eating. Uh, she is um, truly a representation of what she tells the world in many ways, but uh, more importantly, if you dig deeper below the brand, uh, you would see an incredible story of vulnerability, of, uh, of success, of perseverance, of resilience, uh, and uh, of uh, living true to her feminine, I would say, in a very interesting way. Uh, so one of my heroes, uh, I hope you'll enjoy this as much as I will, uh, Ella Mills. Uh, Ella, thank you for being here. No, thank you for having me. I don't know uh, how to begin. I get confused following you because your <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> your story is, uh, is a beautiful roller coaster where I don't know. I mean, you confirmed this today as I met you, but even on the screen, you're, you're beautifully delicate and feminine and the world takes you through journeys of enormous success. And then the typical approach of the British media is to try and I never understood, actually. I, I, ne I never understood why they attacked healthy eating. Like, does it make any sense to me? Me neither. <laughs> and, and, and then put you at the face of that. And then, uh, you know, I also don't understand what the British people would sign on to that. But it seems that whatever the media will say, they'll believe. And then you get back into enormous success. And then, you know, like with your podcast, you choose to let go of some of them. And fr from the external eye, it feels like very, um, uh, you know, erratic if you think about it. But then as I look deeply at your statements that maybe some people don't uh, listen to, I find a very beautiful journey of self-discovery, of trying to be an, in alignment with who you really are, which I really think is amazing. So uh, for our international uh, viewers who, or listeners who may not know you uh, and may not know your story, maybe if you're comfortable, share with us uh, what made Ella Ella. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it all started in, in 2011. Up until that point, kind of nothing really of note. Um, but I was in my second year at university and I was deeply unambitious. I really didn't know who I was or who I wanted to be. I had a very limited sense of self and, and relatively poor self-esteem. But I, in retrospect, I know that. I didn't really know that at the time. Mm. Couldn't quite put my finger on why I wasn't happy as such. And But out of what felt like nowhere, I became very, very ill. And I spent the rest of 2011 in bed or in nap hospitals. And I saw... 
every neurologist and gastroenterologist and endocrinologist and I had MRIs and ultrasounds and colonoscopies and endoscopies and goodness knows how many blood tests and what um, was the problem? So I had effectively a malfunctioning of my autonomic nervous system. So everything that should be happening automatically wasn't. Um, so the condition is characterized by this inability to control your heart rate. So when you sit down, your heart rate's normal. So say at 60, and then I would stand up and within a second or so, my heart rate's 180, 190. Oh, wow. Yeah, and your blood pressure can drop at the same time. And so either you feel like you'll black out, you will black out. But essentially, it feels like your head is disconnected from your body. Oh and, my God. Um, but then within that, then so many other systems aren't working properly either. So I actually looked more pregnant at that point than I did when I was about seven months pregnant with my daughter. Really? Yeah, I had extreme chronic fatigue. I would sleep for kind of 18 hours a day at the worst oh points. My God. The idea of standing up was so exhausting. It was kind of hard to comprehend. I had chronic pain, I had chronic infections. Um, I had pins and needles in my body all the time because my blood wasn't circulating properly. And I was on about 25 or so different medications a day. And they're all repurposed from other conditions. No one promises that they'll work. But I think, I just assumed that they would, right? You have this kind of, I think at that point, slightly blind trust in... <laughs> in uh, in experts and, and having the solution. And what then transpired was that none of them worked. Some of them made a small difference. Some of them had side effects that made other things worse. Yeah, exactly. And essentially, yeah. we kind of ended up a year later having not really place. made any progress. And what was very clear was that I would never be able to live whatever a normal life is. And I think the, every year of life you you get to live, you realize that there's no such thing as a normal life, but the yeah. things you take for granted, like getting a job and living away from home, et cetera, like that just wasn't going to be plausible for me. Um, and I think it was in realizing that, which I'd slightly, I think it would be fair to say I took no responsibility whatsoever for the first year of the illness. And I just consistently wanted someone else to have the solution. I felt that my life was unfair. I felt, why me? that whole kind of rhetoric and I, yeah, I took no responsibility or did nothing to help myself. And it's so interesting when you talk about this, I had the exact opposite. I don't actually talk about this publicly, but when I started to jump into corporate America very heavily, yeah. uh, I started to have what I thought was like irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and my response to that was to completely ignore it and just run like mad. Mm. And I would go to specialists. I remember vividly after like 10 or, or, or so specialists, someone told me there is this guy in a city that's 120 kilometers away. And so I would go to him every other week uh, for I don't know, know how long until he eventually said, okay, we've tried every medicine now, so all we can do is try them again. And when you tell the story, you're like, yeah. I was like, oh, so you were just experimenting on me. And he said, yeah, I have no idea what you're going through. And eventually, believe it or not, it just turned out to be, uh, you know, food allergies. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I was eating the exact foods I shouldn't be eating. Yeah. And I did that for like nine years running. I was a disaster and they were just experimenting on me. It's crazy, really. Yeah, I know. And that's the thing. And I just so wanted... And they, you know, it wasn't as a criticism to the doctors. They were, they were doing what they could do, but I, I just wanted them to fix it for me. Right. And, yeah. um, and I guess that's been like one of my biggest lessons in life is learning that that's not really how the world works. <laughs> you don't right. get to yeah. where you want by thinking someone else will do it for you. Um, how old were you at the time? Twenty-one. Oh. So very young. Yeah, but I mean, no blame there. Um, no, you, no, no, no. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You, but. Um, Anyway, and it was in, in this realization that basically I was never, as I said, it wasn't ambitious. It's not like I had this clear sense of what I wanted for my life. But what was clear was that any, any of the potential avenues I could explore, any of the things I may or may not want in my life, none of which was going to be possible if I continued on the trajectory that I was on. Um, and I had no friends at this point. I was a complete, you know, I was in a very dark place and... I think it was in finally taking responsibility and the the time that the doctor said, I don't have anything else. Mm. And is that kind of, that was such a crashing weight. And I think as that sort of subsided and was absorbed, I realized like, 
okay, I'm going to have to do something. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's, okay. <laughs> it's either I do something and we try and change the trajectory or you give up essentially. And like, yeah. I couldn't really see the point in, in being here at that point. And, but I had no idea what to do, like absolutely no idea whatsoever. And so we started Googling and reading stories about other people all around the world who do use different approaches, but this kind of, focus on diet and lifestyle and changing the way they looked after their bodies and there was this amazing common thread of that having a huge difference in treating their various different illnesses yeah and i just felt okay i mean i had nothing to lose at this point if it worked for them maybe it would work for me but i couldn't cook i had no idea what healthy food was and in particularly like vegetables. So I was, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, I wasn't starting from the best place. And um, so I thought, okay, well, that's what I'll do. And I, I knew I needed some kind of focus. I, because I couldn't do anything, I didn't do anything. Mm. And so I sat all day and I slept or I literally stared at the ceiling or I refreshed my Facebook page where I watched terrible reality TV. And like, while that might be nice for a weekend, you know, nine months later, it's yeah. not good for your brain. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll do this as a project. I will teach myself to cook and I will see if this works. Um, so I started writing it all down and that was deliciousiella.com. Um, so where everything started. That's and amazing. So you started that without knowing if it will work or not. No, I had no idea. Couldn't cook. Recipes were so bad to start with. And, um, but it was, you know, I'd been on and off this cocktail of medications for a year. And at no point did I feel they were working. Like something might help one symptom, but then it would have a side effect it's, for something of else. And yeah. so I never felt, I never kind of saw any semblance of light during that year. Um, but within about two months of changing the way that I was eating, I did start to feel not like I was leaping out of bed and running down the street by any means, but I started to feel this glimmer of something shifting. Mm. And, you know, the brain fog was a little bit less. The pain was a little bit less. Like getting out of bed was just a little bit easier. And it took two years or so to really get to a point of, for want of a better word, normal um health um so it was it was a slow process um which was yeah definitely taught me a lot about resilience and i did a rehabilitation exercise program by a doctor at the same time and i mean i was on one of those kind of um reclined uh rowing machines and i would do five minutes and sleep for about two hours afterwards and so again, and I built that up over a year to be able to do 45 minutes on a um, cross trainer and having been able to not even do five minutes on a rower, that mm. was obviously enormous um, for me. But, but are, you, so are you telling me that uh, fatigue, brain fog, heart condition, uh, you know, and, and you just chose food. Okay, I'm going to eat differently. That's to me is sort of like, like, to my engineer's mind, I would go like, okay, we need to invent a little valve that goes on the heart and does this, and then we need to do that. I mean, it appears to me like a much more complex problem than yeah, just food. It was certainly a much more complex problem. And I think sort of over the years, I've understood a little bit more and a little bit more about why it might have worked, like reducing inflammation, massively improving gut health, et cetera. You can see why it would start to make an impact, but it also makes sense that it took me about two years to feel normal-ish and about five years to wow. live a kind of normal life again. Mm. Um, so it was a very, very, very slow process. And you still stuck to it? Still stuck to it. And I think my, and my mum was absolutely instrumental in that. She would always say, because I would find it very hard that you were taking and I'm sure everyone can relate to this in different parts of their life, you know, you're working so hard at something and it's so difficult and it's requiring such discipline and sacrifice and you feel like you're taking one step forward and two step backwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would feel like I was really making improvement and I would have three days where I could leave the house and I could do things and then I would have pushed it a little bit far and I would spend four days back in bed again and I'd mm -hmm. feel like I was back at square one and she would always remind me, like, this bad day is better than your bad day two months ago like yes oh, it's that's a bad so, day such an insightful way yeah, of looking at but it. it's a better bad day 
It's a better it's bad a better day. bad day. And she was so she was absolutely right. Like whilst I was still in bed, I would be you know the room would feel like it was spinning a bit less. Like I would be able to read, oh and God, so it was a really. Um, and I don't think I could have done it without having that consistent. In general, I think every every progress we've ever made in life depends on that. Depends on the fact that you know you go to the gym for the first you know two weeks and you will only feel the pain and see no progress whatsoever. And the idea is, can you stay the course basically? Exactly. And I think in the in the world today, that's very challenging. Like we just love a quick fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's we, we're old, very yeah. used to instant gratification, and so. Yeah something that feels like it's going to take you years is not particularly appealing, which is why I wanted the doctors to have the answers. I wanted oh, to take a pill yeah. and not have to do anything. Yeah. Like I wanted someone else to solve it for me. And I think what we're saying to our viewers is that doesn't work, does it? Yeah. I think rarely. And obviously that's like one specific circumstance, but I think anything, yeah, anything I can think of ultimately, like I think we are so deeply responsible for ourselves yeah um but it's a very hard thing it really <laughs> to is. take on board we were we were uh, i was spent i spent the weekend on a retreat an ama amazing experience we had 146 people who you would expect it's an unstressable retreat you would expect that you get like the most stressed yeah. people in the world right so we were really dreading it walking in myself and alice my co-author but then they turned out to be some of the most impressive, amazing, loving, lovable uh, sort of spiritual seekers who are trying to find a better version of themselves, even though this version is doing really well. And, you know, we were discussing that idea of doing the work and, you know, how happiness for most of us is like, okay, so life gave me this wonderful partner for a week. Thanks, life. I'll be happy. Uh, you know, he annoyed me next week. So what's up with you, life? Can you fix it, right? <laughs> and you know, you you saw we were talking about that idea of no, it's never going to be that way. It's always going to you're going to have to do the work. It's your only choice, basically. Yeah. So 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 I want to I want to continue on your personal story because I think it's really really inspiring. But let's just take a tangent a tiny bit about food. So you said it it reduces inflammation. It does this. It does that. It does. There are lots of people out there that claim that if you eat healthy, a lot of the stuff will go away. Uh, a lot of what we now consider normal illnesses, like normal illnesses is a very strange word, but we just go on, get on with it and swallow a pill would disappear. It, you know, how true is that? I mean, it's it's hard to be kind of totally binary in the response because there's a huge number of people that are affected by all sorts of conditions where that's not true in any shape or form and it's wildly frustrating to have that like any that's a beautiful conversation that yeah. feels a kind of sweeping statements that being said there's also an extraordinary number of people with lifestyle related diseases that potentially don't have to feel the way that they feel right now mm. and that there are ways of alleviating reversing minimizing what they feel every day but ultimately it's incredibly difficult to change it like the, yeah. the world that we live in today the health or lack thereof landscape is you kind of have to go against the status quo almost all day every day to make healthy choices and of course it depends where you live in the world like if you live in LA you're probably feeling that a little bit differently but mm. certainly if you're living in the UK if you're living in a huge part of the world like the vast majority of the food that you can buy. I mean, almost 70% of the calories we consume in this country come from ultra-processed food. Yeah. Like, that means almost 70% yeah. of the food that we're eating is actively probably quite harmful for our health. And, and we know that now. And, you know, it's taken people a long time to sort of slowly catch up with it. But we know that emulsifiers are terrible for our gut health. We know our gut health is pivotal to our physical health, but also to our mental health. And it's like, I think we're starting to piece the pieces of the puzzle together and understand why potentially we need to change the way that we eat but then actually going to do that day in and day out I don't think you can underestimate how difficult it actually oh, is do. to do because you go into any supermarket any shop and the vast majority of what's being sold to you is actually quite bad for your health that, that's a very very 
profound but true statement, I would have to say. I mean, did you see that donut guy around the corner here? <laughs> I swear, I mean, like, I, I and I'm, you know, I, I don't even like sweet things anymore, but he's so good at it. And I'm like, I need one of those every time I pass by. But it's not just that. It's also that when you go to the supermarket, anything that's within a box is not right for you. Not necessarily. Like, mm. there's, there's definitely, there's a fundamental difference between processed food and ultra processed food, but it's, yeah, it's it's just very difficult to navigate, and there is nothing wrong with having a donut. And there's nothing wrong with having. Did you say, just say that? Yeah, can, but can if we it's, stop? Can we pause just, recording for a minute? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's you know, it's just about you know, and it's a frustrating word in so many ways because it can be so kind of um, untangible for people. But it is about balance. Like if what the vast majority of what you're eating is a kind of plant-rich whole food diet, where you're cooking chickpeas and lentils and carrots and things and then you eat a donut donut's not going to do anything mm. but we love rules and we love all or nothing and we love a diet and so that's a very difficult mm. sell for people but also you really have to go out of your way to do to make the healthy choices and people have a extraordinary number of responsibilities in their life pulled in a thousand and one different directions right. everybody is extraordinarily time poor and so i don't underestimate how difficult it is to make the change, but the difference that people feel when they start to switch the way they eat is quite mm. extraordinary. And I think at that point, it's quite hard to go back yeah. to how you ate before because you feel it very quickly. Oh, 100%, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, uh, it's around this time, exactly this time last year, I went on a 40 days silent retreat. I, I, I always do that in August. And, uh, and uh, I ordered, uh, um, food plan mm. but i knew the founder of the company so i described to her exactly i said i want an anti-inflammatory food plan and oh my god ella like day five it's not even that long no yeah i just i was a totally different person it's to the point that you know and, and food plans are not a lot of food they're not little food i ordered a little extra because i was away on retreat and so on but it just flipped my life upside down it's incredible really then you go back to the real world and you're traveling and you're... And it's really hard to keep it up. And yeah. I think that's why, that's why I think it, you just, I can't overemphasize enough the, the challenge that it takes, I think, to continue to implement that. Yeah. But then equally how much we collectively need to. It's a, it's a difficult conversation. So, so what does Ella eat today? What did I eat today? No, I, I mean, in general, your day. My day, I eat, like, I eat very simply, to be honest. Like, mm. I've got a lot of commitments <laughs> in my life and I've got two little kids as well and so I have a huge amount of time to cook and I do really miss that like I really mm. miss um having more time to cook and in the evenings and things because by the time I've got my kids into bed it's it's late and you know yeah. it's, but it's so it's not it's simple things it's like quick veggie stir fries with a miso dressing lots of garlic and ginger or it's like every time I cook something, I make three or four times as much. So I put it in the freezer. So I make lots of curries and dolls and just easy veggie based dishes. But um, yeah, I basically my freezer is just full of little bags. And freezer is OK. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. OK, that would change my life, interestingly, in a very interesting way. Don't always have a freezer, but when I'm at home. But I when you're it. at home, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so go back, back to Ella. That was the time when Deliciously Ella started. Exactly. Now, I actually don't know exactly what we loved about you. Did we love your your cooking, your recipes, whether your message or yourself? We didn't, you know, there was something magical about Deliciously Ella when it came out. I don't know what it was. And I don't say that to be like wildly self-deprecating. I just, I don't think I'll ever really know or I'll ever really understand what it was about what I was doing that had such an impact. The site had 130 million hits in the first two years. Ooh. And I and I I can't it's frustrating. Now obviously we have our business, like my husband and I own it together. We work so hard. And at that point I was not working so hard. Like yeah, I didn't yeah. I wasn't trying. And it somehow just resonated with people in such a unexpected way. And it's interesting because I, as I said earlier, like I, I didn't have particularly high self-esteem. In fact, I had very poor self-esteem. I 
that obviously took a real beating when I got ill and I became even more kind of unsure of myself and who I was in the world and and I was very uncomfortable with myself in in being ill and um and so I didn't I wanted it to be really anonymous I wanted it to be about the food I didn't really want to bring myself into it but back in 2011 early 2012 these sorts of recipes were very niche it was quite weird why are you doing this and so a friend of mine and I only told her about it I didn't show it to anybody else for the first three months I was very embarrassed I thought everyone would think I was very weird <laughs> uh-huh. and um but she said I just I just don't really understand like I I think if you don't have literally an about page and like anyone who comes across this website they've got to know why you're doing it, it they're just going to feel weird otherwise like you need to write your story and you need to say what you're trying to do and what the point of the site is and so we sat down and I think it was again it was the first time I'd sort of owned my story effectively and what had happened and why I was trying to change the trajectory of, of my life and where I was at that point which was very cathartic actually and because I didn't really know how to talk about what was happening and because I was quite unsure of myself I basically hadn't told anyone what had happened I just stopped talking to people um and it's it's not my best personality trait um but I'm very introverted really and I you are yeah and I am like weirdly shy which is very counter intuitive and being in the spotlight to what my job is but um yeah so I it was the first time I think as well a few months later when when I did show some people what I've been doing that people were like oh that's where Ella's been for the last year like I thought she just stopped talking to us um and kind of went off the deep end and so that was quite cathartic anyway the site just suddenly took off and I think there's always a right time right place right when when things are successful um I don't know if you feel that in any way with your work that it's just it it coincides with a moment in which people are looking for the sorts of things that you do and suddenly there's just a kind of collective shift in thinking about their mental health or thinking about their physical health and I think that coincided with a real lack of resources. I never would have started mm-hmm. Delicious Yella if I got ill today because there's just no need. I would have found all the recipes that I was looking for from other people, but yeah. none of them existed at that point, which is why I started doing them and why I started cooking. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think there was a right time, right place. It was a kind of early start of this conversation around what we eat having such a big impact on our health and our well being. I think that's um, it. And I guess there was as the story went on and my health obviously started to get better. I think there was, it was a story that really interested people on taking food and and making yourself better with it. I I think that's it. If you ask me now that you say it, it's super clear for me because in a, in a very interesting way, you did not do this because you were starting a business and having a business plan and trying to, to uh, grow the hits by this much and you know improve the following by that much and so on, which is the typical way everyone uh, you know does business and then they pretend to have a persona and then they t- pretend to put that persona online and sometimes they fool people with it. I mean, this slow mo being you know in the top five now almost consistently in in, in health and well being. I have no idea why. I honestly don't know why the, you know you guys like this. I really don't know. Okay, but to me, that message of slowing down in in comparison to how I lived my incredibly fast paced life as a real executive is very very genuine to me. And as I as I myself started to slow down and reflect on topics that matter, really, uh, you know, just flipped my life upside down. And so I think there is something about the lack of genuine, um, you know, not even, I, I'm, you know, honestly, s- sometimes I think about it. I'm, I'm, I mean, Snowmo seems to be my biggest arm of making a difference because of its reach uh, as part of one, my One Billion Happy Mission. But I promise you, I don't film it because of that. I film it because I wanted to meet you, honestly. You, you know what I mean? I, I love that idea of spending an hour and a half, two hours a week with someone that will inspire me and teach me something. And the fact that we film it is the bonus, if you want. I I think that's the thing, isn't it? It just, it comes through when it's so genuine. genuine. And I, 
never meant to start a business at all. Um, it never meant even a tiny bit to end up doing what we do now. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's a very unusual way to start a business, but it has it has worked not because it was meant to work, but because I think you start to create a genuine connection with people and there's a, a reason to believe that's not just the price point on shelf or what yeah. packaging looks like, etc. Yeah, but but you are a shrewd businesswoman, are you not? No, like, and I, again, and it's a really interesting one because I, I think I would have found that really hard to say in the past. Yeah. Um, I probably have like very, I think I'm a very contradictory person with a huge number of conflicting personality traits, probably. Um, I'm a Gemini, so I feel like oh, that hello. <laughs> speaks so, so I, perfectly. Yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying the four of us talking <laughs> exactly. to Geminis. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, and so I did it until 2015 by myself. And my first book came out in January 2015. No, the first thing I did, I didn't, I started doing cooking classes and supper clubs and things, but that was all very small. And, but I guess a very like your mission, you know, one billion happy and I've never quantified how many people I want to reach, but I wanted to reach a big number of people. I yeah. wanted to, I just had this and I still have it. And sometimes I'm like, why do I do this? I'm so tired. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> but I still, you know, anytime I have a conversation like this, it's really reignited. Like I never want people to feel how I felt if they don't have to. And I know you you get that and it's, and so that's what spurs me on and it keeps spurring me on. And so I've always wanted what we do to reach the biggest number of people as possible, not because everybody has to engage in it, but because hopefully that will, you know, allow as many people as would like to, to be able to. And I, so I did an app in 2014 and that was the first moment that I was like, what's happening here? Um, so it was a very simple recipe app. Um, I don't think it was one ninety nine or two ninety nine. And I went to number one in the whole of the app store. Wow. And it had no, mar I mean, when I say no marketing, like I was 23 or something at this point. Um, it was just me working by myself with an Instagram page. And it went to number one on the app store and I thought, okay, this is quite interesting. Mm. <laughs> I think people with a lot of money spend a lot of time trying to get to that spot, mm. you know, with massive number of people, highly qualified people. And on the back of that, I approached um, several publishers to write a book and, and I um, got commissioned to write the book by um, my publisher at that point. And that came out in the, January 2015. And again, it wasn't expected to be a success. It really wasn't, but it became the fastest selling debut cookbook ever in the UK. Spent eight weeks oh, wow. consecutively at number mm. one on Amazon across any category, fiction, nonfiction. And it really ignited this conversation on health and wellness in a way that hadn't happened in this country up until that point. It was really the first of its kind. And obviously there's lots of amazing people working in this space now and lots of people making a profound difference. Um, but it was very novel. Um, and that was an extraordinary experience, but it, um, it was all very kind of reactive and uh, fluid and sort of um, like ideas based at that point. And I met my now husband three weeks after the book came out. Oh. Yeah. And Is that true? Yeah, yeah, did we he, met. Did he court you or did you find him? He found me, yeah. Oh, yes, of yeah. course. Oh, um, that man. But through our parents. Was oh, that true? Yeah, so my oh, so mum. So it wasn't like he saw you on a TV interview and, sh and said she's mine? <laughs> no. Well, you know what I say, I love. It's not that, it's not that far off it. Um, his mum and my dad had worked together for a long, long time. And I didn't know him and I hadn't met his mum, but he knew my dad. And um, oh, that, that's an advantage. It's an advantage, yeah. exactly. <laughs> anyway, he was working um, at a so in a social impact group in West Africa, mm -hmm. and they had been hit really hard by Ebola, and oh, yeah. um, so they were sort of kind of scratching around on what to do next. And he was very interested in what I was doing with food, and could there be some connection between what they were doing? They had a huge number of farms, etc. And so he reached out to my dad and was like, We've "Just been reading." An Is article. that what he told him? 
That's what he told oh, him. Oh, no. We have to get him and see what's true yeah, and what's no, not. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, yeah, but, that's um, the But he went the interview that I did in The Times, uh -huh. and that was how he was like, oh, I, I know her dad. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and so we, we actually moved in together a week later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, engaged three months later. He'd quit his job and, and to work together. But he is the business person in in the partnership. It's it's really not me. It's I. Everything about the essence of Delicious Ciela is me. The reason that we do what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And it actually really existing as it is today is all him. That's so interesting. Yeah. That's basically... So we've really enabled each other. Yeah, but it's also almost like if life is saying this needs to be complete, it needs to work. You know, it's uh, these are a few too many interesting coincidences, one after the next, to, to get you to a place uh, where you are. I mean, I, I take my hat, hat off to him. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think he should write a book about courting the woman that you want. I think that would sell really well, if you ask me. Uh, yeah, talk to her dad and say Ebola and yeah, West exactly. Africa, wink, wink. <laughs> but, uh, but also, I mean, to convince her to move in a week later. A week later, yeah. Th was three. that his idea or you? <laughs> It was both of us. No, like it was, you know, he made you think it was <laughs> both of us. <laughs> it's brainwashing. No, it was just this really... I think we'd both felt a bit lost in our lives and we met each other and it was just this extraordinary sense oh, of feeling beautiful. at home. And Oh, that's so beautiful. As someone also who didn't even know if they believed in marriage or, like, you know, anything, yeah. it, was a, it was a bit of a... I was certainly not someone who would, like, believe in a soulmate premise or a love at first sight or anything along that realm of possibility so it was uh yeah i definitely wasn't looking for it which is what's even more interesting mm. about it mm. but that was also the time when the media started to that was about two years later that that really uh -huh. turned yeah that was sort of beginning of 2017 end of 2016 what was that about so there had been this kind of complete explosion about healthy living and healthy cooking and, you know, and a huge number of books published and everything over that sort of 18-month, two-year period, which, in my opinion, can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Not for the media. Yeah, I think there was this sense of, you know, don't tell us what to do. Um, oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah everyone can live their own lives and you know I don't want to eat kale so so go away in the simplest form of it but it's interesting and again like I was I was very young and inexperienced and not confident enough that I I think I would handle it very 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 differently at this point but it was the whole kind of backlash and the whole conversation was solely focused on women um, it was everyone who was sort of criticized as part of this healthy eating movement, which was such a terrible thing, which even just saying that out loud feels so ironic, given the state of our health and the state of the NHS as a result. It's, it does, it feels ironic that we're so cross about healthy eating, but there we go. Um, everyone who was criticized as part of that conversation was a woman. There were no, which is so interesting. And um, okay, I'm, I'm going to make a joke. This is a joke. It's because you talk about quinoa too much. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stand quinoa. And it was very, yeah, it was very interesting. And there was, you know, lots of men obviously, of course, involved but, but, in this but space. What, what and you're people saying is would, that a, a male chef wouldn't be criticized, but a well, woman. They, well, they weren't. And a lot of them talked a lot more about weight loss and before and after. Like, I have never once mentioned weight loss. We've never talked about it. We would never talk about it. So it was just this very interesting lens. So, and, and, and the media reporters that were in that space obviously were not women. No, well, no, no, lots of them were. And, you know, there was one that wrote a whole article about how I was just like Donald Trump. I mean, it was really like... You? Yeah, it was, it was ways, really... If I, may ask. <laughs> I didn't read it. I was like, okay, I can't. Good, yeah, good practice, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was, it was very vindictive and it was highly personal and it was... Um, Debate is very important, but this was not a debate. This was, yeah, yeah it was very I'm strange. Very but it's also really bizarre when we live in a world of increased lifestyle-related diseases, increased obesity, increased childhood obesity, when we know we have to change the way we eat. You know, 25% of people manage to eat their five a day. Like, we're so far away from eating the way we need to eat. And we have, 
yeah, worsening both mental health and physical health. Like we have to change our approach to food. So it's very interesting. I think if I had only written books on how to bake very indulgent cakes, I don't think I would have had any criticism. So <laughs> At all, yeah. No, yeah, which yeah. is, it is but interesting. But you wouldn't have had the love either, I think. No, no. It's not really you, so. No, but, exactly. And yeah, I, I would yeah. never have done it. But it was just, um, I've always found that kind of an interesting if, thought. If, if you put it all together, the criticism and the media... But it was a lot of young women, and yeah. I think it was, yeah, a frustration with kind of young women coming in and, and this sense of telling people what to do. And I would never want anyone to feel I was telling them what to do. It's really about sharing what you the options, you exactly, if yeah. you want to engage in it or you don't. Yeah. Um, did it work for you at all? I mean, did you believe that at the end of it, did they tell the world more about your work and so you find more people to love you, or was it painful without no it was really painful actually mm. i think it was really um yeah it was really painful when i when i started soul for happy i'm actually going to be with pierce morgan again tonight uh, and i actually <laughs> i'm starting to like him a lot uh, but the first time i published soul for happy and i wasn't really well experienced with the media in the uk i mean i was a google executive so i knew how to handle media in general but i went on a pierce morgan show and, you know, basically he started hammering me. And halfway through, I said, I'm here to talk about happiness. Why are you so grumpy? <laughs> and it was really, you know, it was quite interesting because I think there is something specifically about the British media, maybe, I mean, everywhere, but I think it's very accentuated, if you want, in the British media of like, we're not going to talk about the positive side of anything. We're just going to look specifically for the, you know, a negative angle and we're going to associate it with a face and then we're going to hammer that face basically yeah i mean it makes for good reading right yeah and i think that's it, a, yeah well you know in some senses of, of the word good yeah and um <laughs> so yeah it made me feel very introverted so you hi you hid away yeah it made me feel um very vanilla Mm. Like I didn't oh. want to really have an opinion anymore. Yeah, you didn't want to. You don't really want to out. kind of stick your head above the parapet. You don't oh, want to stand out. And it took me a long, long, long time to to come back from that. Mm. So yeah, you you did three uh, deliciously Ella books until then. Until then, yeah. And now four. So only one after. No, four more after. Uh, four more after. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I felt I really wanted to just remove myself from it. I was just very, um, yeah, lacking an opinion. And, mm. um, yeah, just I really struggled to to get my head around it. And we, we had a really similar experience around the same time because when we started, my husband and I, Matthew, working together, there were two clear routes to go down, either... Um, sites like a pre premise uh, or um, to like uh, food to go or um, foods and supermarkets mm. and so we thought we'd try both and we would see which one was going to work yeah. better um, or it was going to be a little bit of both who knows and so we opened our first cafe at the end of 2015 that December and we started selling our products into retail in mid 2016 and by um mid 2017 it was very very clear that the retail products was the future of the company yeah, cafes are very difficult wildly difficult and hugely expensive Absolutely. Um, and we didn't want to you know sell 80 percent of the company to raise enough money to be Correct. able to open them and um we didn't need to do that to do the, yeah, it's the same business. amount of pressure Exactly. And, you know, and doing own, both was it. not feasible because the products business was taking off at such a huge rate. Yeah. And so we thought we, we decided to close. We had three cafes Very at brave. this point and we decided to close two of them, keep the biggest one. We've now turned that into a restaurant. And it was a really difficult decision. It obviously, um, you know, it means people lose some jobs, um, but also like from a kind of brand perspective obviously it's, it's complicated and yeah. you know removing a sense of ego from things that you do is is hard it's a big life lesson you know you don't want people to think that you have failed as such and it was a really interesting experience like 
we knew we needed to get to about six or seven sites to make the the model really make sense because by three you Very have expensive. high operating costs and, yeah. and high people costs and and we'd got to three and they're all profitable site level they were where we wanted them to be but the business didn't make sense until you probably had another two to three at least yeah. um and we decided not to do that and so to close the two yeah and there was just this again like it was only a few months later and people were just loving that we had what they said was failed, loving it. Yeah. And it was such an insightful experience. Um, and like I had a, you know, a very good girlfriend of mine say like she had a few because the, their papers wrote about it to the point that one of the big four, the big four retailers, the CEO called me and was like, do we need to have a serious conversation like are you going to have all your products off shelf because you've gone bust it's like we oh, haven't yeah. gone bust yeah. this is a comp like the reporting is so at odds with the reality but and an not a single one of the successes you know we'd gone from having no products in no stores to having i can't remember what it was like 10 products in 6,000 stores in 12 months, you know, huge growth. None of that, no, that wasn't even mentioned at any point. Yeah. Not even as like an asterisk at the end. It was literally just like delicious yellow fails and closes business. And that, that's the headline that people will pick up. Exactly. For. And it, um, but yeah, I had this girlfriend say, you know, she had a few of her friends who called her up like quite gleeful, yeah. like quite thrilled um, <laughs> that it wasn't working for us. And it was, yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience. And again, it was just this, yeah, I mean, running a business and owning a business and, and talking to that many people every day, it's as like humbling as it oh, gets yeah, and it keeps you kind of completely grounded because there's always a problem, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. But it was realizing, yeah, the kind of complexities and nuances of standing out and doing things differently and, and deciding to, yeah, kind of try and make a mark, and and that's that can be quite uncomfortable for other people. Yeah, I mean, I I, I co-founded a couple of food businesses. Yeah, nightmares, absolute nightmares. There is so much responsibility around it as well. You want to, you want everything to be perfect. You want the food, you know, to be healthy. You want the you know hygiene to be one hundred percent. You can't afford ninety nine point nine nine. And they're just very demanding. They're just very, very, very demanding. And then you, I think like you, but of course I'm never in the spotlight with that other side of me. Uh, but like you, it just doesn't make sense at all because the same amount of effort could start two other businesses. And, you know, yes, you're right. If you fund it properly and waste a lot of resources on the path and end up with a large number of out outlets, yeah, it's a scale business. But it would take your entire life. You would literally be able to do nothing else. Right? No, and it was just realizing exactly that. Like I think, you know, I, I think learning to accept where you've made mistakes and made yeah. things and got things wrong, and the quicker you act on it, the better. Yeah. Um, but that's a hard thing to do in a in a kind of more public yeah. landscape. I think that's yeah. hard for anybody to do in their lives. Is yeah. you know, it's often why we stay in relationships, why we stay in jobs, why yeah. we stay living in some place, or yeah, because of the stay in of friendships, etc. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say, you know, put your hand up and say, look, I, I got this wrong. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is the right thing. Yeah. Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. How is working with your husband? I know it's so weird because people just, uh, no one get like, everyone thinks it's strange, but it's honestly amazing. Is it? Yeah, it's the, it's I like him. in so guy. many ways, like the foundation of, well, I was going to say the foundation of our relationship because we've never not worked together, essentially. Like within three months of being together, we were working together. And it was harder in a way at the beginning because, you know, obviously when you're in a startup and there's like four or five people, technically you might have a job but you don't really have a job like everybody has the yeah. same job and it's all this like all hands on deck everyone's in the same meeting basically and it's just mm. this kind of frantic mess and it's really fun but it is a frantic mess and but now as the company's grown and and we've evolved we have such different jobs mm. like most days we go into work together and we come home together and I love that and you have this extraordinary understanding of the other person like I couldn't have underestimated less how difficult it is to own a business. Like that oh, level yeah. of responsibility, oh, yeah. the relentlessness of it. 
And having that as a problem shared is such a gift. And I think we understand each other so completely. But the other thing is, and then you like, when the other person excels, like you really understand it, mm. you know, because I understand all the complexities that have gone into something coming it's off of him. Yeah. And, you know, when, when it goes right and you see that, like, I think you have, it's just a very kind of rich way of living together, I think, because you understand every part of the other person. That being said, it's obviously very intense. Like, yeah. you know, we've got two kids together, we work together, we're together probably 80% of our time, like maybe more. Um, do you separate your personas? Like, you know, do you, do you speak about work uh, at dinner? Do you kiss at work? Yeah, they're not that separate. Oh. I think they're not really separate at all. Yeah. I mean, like a teeny bit, obviously, but not not really. And I, I kind of like it. It's a really a part. I think you almost, we've tried to kind of separate it because you feel like people expect it to be separate and want it to be separate. But actually, I kind of enjoy that it's not. It's just our life and it's who we are and I, I really believe as well so strongly that no one can be all things at any point in their lives and we so want to kind of have it all be it all but it, it's just not really how life works like you've got to have your priorities and in, in yeah. different chapters of your life and as it stands ours are work and our kids like that's really all we do mm. and and so having that shared is amazing I mean I have to say when you said uh it gets you to understand what success, what you know, what he's putting in, definitely is a part of something. You know, of maybe what I struggled with is that my family never really. I I don't know how to say, it, but I don't think they really ever understood the amount of effort it took to provide what I provided, right? It, you, you know, yeah. Because because the minute I'm at work, this whole thing disappears, and then I show up ten hours later or a couple of days later if I'm traveling. And they're like, yes, he's back and everything's available and everything's working and he seems to be calm and quiet. So, you know, they don't really relate to how uncalm. <laughs> That's and, it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like, oh, look, we have times where we're flying and mm. it's phenomenal and mm. it's like, but then you have a lot of times that are like anyone in, yeah. in their job, um, particularly I think when you have a lot of responsibility that are really hard and they're really sticky and you have to dig so deep and, and it's, you know, you really feel like you're soul searching and it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And I don't know, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. I don't know what our relationship would be if it would be how it would work if we hadn't have done it together. I think I would have, if it was him doing this and I had nothing to do with it, I, I can't help but feel maybe I would resent him because he wouldn't be present enough or he wouldn't be available enough or he would be distracted at this point. Like, I think we counted that in the first five years we were together, we canceled 17 holidays. Did you? Um, it was, yeah, and we kept rebooking stuff, obviously, yeah. to like try but, but it again. But you did it together, right? Exactly, because things would come up and we'd made these commitments and we'd employed these people and we were building this company and we put it first. But you mm. never, you never, ever, ever felt Frustrated, frustrated. You might feel frustrated at the situation. Yeah. Like I wish we could do that, but never, ever, ever at the other person. Always with the other person. Like you would both be a bit disappointed, you'd both be a bit frustrated, but never just at the situation potentially. Like our first anniversary after we got married, we were going to go to Paris for the weekend, and we were literally on the way to the Eurostar. And we were listing our granolas into Tesco, amazing opportunity. And they had changed the date that they needed all the information by from, say, three weeks from that Friday to the following Monday. Mm -hmm. So we had the weekend to get it finished. So mm -hmm. I turned the cab back around, did not go to Paris and spend the weekend in a porter cabin in the Midlands getting the granola recipe finished. Like that mm -hmm. was our anniversary. Instead of having like a romantic weekend, we ate probably like eight kilos of granola. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just funny, you yeah. know, it's just like you just kind of find it funny and like it's just part of it. And it's just what you do. And I I can only imagine in a relationship when you are in a kind of high pressured situation or you have a huge amount of responsibility, it can be challenging yeah, when the other I mean, person I mean, doesn't understand it. And how can you understand it if you're not in the room? 
I, I, th I think that's a huge message, honestly, because, you know, if he had made that choice and you were just the one going to, to vacation and you're tired from, you know, being with the kids or whatever, yeah. and the vacation is canceled, now you're very frustrated. The other, the opposite is also true. I think one of the biggest challenges is that ability to have empathy for what the other person is doing, whether, by the way, one of them is a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad or whatever. And, you know, you, when you're at work and involved in all of those meetings and noise and what have you, you can't actually relate to what she's Not going at all, through. Exactly. And, and the opposite is true. Uh, you know, if you're at home or, or, you know, you have a different job and you don't know what they are going through, you can't relate either. And, and that empathy, I think, is a is key really to, to you know, when, when they say that dinner after work where you go and ask, so how was your day? That's not a very superficial question at all. That's actually the whole question. Can we connect? Can we align? Can I empathize with how your day was? Can I be part of your life? It's a very different uh, uh, approach than how was your day? Okay, thank you. Right. Exactly. And I think it's that thing people always say, oh, you have to work really hard in your marriage. And I'm like, I feel like I have to work so hard at so many things in my life. And it's the <laughs> only thing I feel like I don't have to work hard at. Because mm -hmm. we just naturally, because we're so connected. He's a good man. You this don't one. have to. No, like it's not him. you don't have to try, but I it's mean, just you're, you're, you're wonderful like, too, but I like He's him. phenomenal, honestly. Yeah. He is absolutely phenomenal, and he's he's taught me so much. But Did it you is hear this, like, Matthew? I got it out on in public. Huh? <laughs> but honestly, like I think you have to have different skill sets. I think that's the yeah. only thing I would say, is that I think what we both feel quite deeply is that we have enabled the other person in a way that we never would have been able to do on our own. But like everything, I love cooking. He literally can't even make pasta. Like he loves Excel spreadsheets. I can't build one. <laughs> um, so yeah. we are very much bringing different things to the table. So we have our own autonomy. Do you disagree sometimes? Not really. Seriously? Not really, no. I mean, we realized really early on, like you have to have that autonomy. Like you've got to have things you're in charge of and I've got to have things I'm in charge of. You cannot be sitting there day after day, like trying to make the same decision as each other. I think that is really critical. But no, not really. Mm. Like fundamentally, we tend to agree on everything. Um, we have a rule which we said, like as soon as we started working together, is that any big decision, like we both have to give it a green light. And if one of us doesn't want to do it, then we won't do it. Like anything huge has to have both of our complete sign off. That's a democracy I find very difficult at work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll be very open and honest. Actually, one of the biggest struggles I've ever had in my life was that I started a business with a very dear friend and he brought one of his dearest friends. So we were three founders and oh my God, it was impossible to achieve consensus. Yeah. Uh, because one of us was 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 a hyper engineer. I am a hyper mathematician, and uh, our third friend was sort of like a hyper visionary, if you want, not very much into the details at at, at all. And uh, and man, it frustrated the hell out of me, because you know, unlike what you would feel on a slow mo conversation, I'm a very vicious dictator at work. So, I mean, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm very, 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 very empowering to the point that, I, you know, for weeks and weeks, I wouldn't even object to anything as long as my team is empowered and they're doing well. But when I put my foot down, I put my foot down and it's not going to change because my view is that you, uh, you know, he or she who carries the target makes the decisions. So it's not a democracy really at work most of the time. And, and work democracies, I find, are, um, are diluting the responsibility and at the same time, you know, delaying decisions or, or, or removing important decisions. But you seem to... But I'm only talking about like three things a year. Yeah. Like when I'm saying big decisions, I mean like... Are we investing closing... half of our life? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like closing the restaurants. Yeah. Like that, you know, that's something we both yeah. have to agree yeah. that's what I, we're I fully doing. I agree that. But this is like, yeah, as I said, like two or three yeah. times a year otherwise it's as you said like you have to divide it and people yeah. have to have responsibility i think that's yeah. absolutely critical otherwise we drive each other completely mad <laughs> yeah i agree Ella, so you you go from illness to success to business to closures to tough decisions to media where, where are you now in life I don't know it's a really interesting question i think i'm really trying to figure it out i've i i think you have that consistent pull between 
kids and and work. My kids are nearly three and nearly four. And oh, that's a fantastic age. Phenomenal age. And I'm finding more and more it's it's hard not being with them more of the time. Um, I I don't know if it's a normal feeling. I found it a bit easier when they were little, Mm. you know. Um, But now like every day they change, every day they're absorbing everything around them. And so I find the, the kind of the push and pull between between work and home much more challenging. And I think also like I have definitely been on, been on quite a personal journey for one for a better word of kind of actually understanding myself, really accepting these conflicting sides of my personality, this side of me that wants to build the biggest plant-based company in the world and is hugely ambitious and you know would love a billion people to eat better and this other side of me that like would happily just like live in a quiet cottage and take my kids to school every day and grow vegetables (laughs) and I I feel consistently conflicted on how to reconcile these two really wildly different parts of myself and how you kind of nurture both of them because I don't. I definitely couldn't do one and not the other, which is a, You're a so, strange way of living. Yeah, um, we're so aligned on this, and I'll give you good news. I have no idea which to choose either. I was. I don't know. think you can choose one, and I think that's what I'm slowly realizing. Just like I don't think I can choose to just be at home with my kids or just be at work. Like I don't. Is that not? Is that the case? I mean, Galen Tupton, one of oh, the yeah. top. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Monks. Yeah, but he chose monkhood, and I'm dying to. Like, I mean, I don't hide it. Uh, there is a, a deep calling within me to say disappear for four years in a hermitage somewhere and, you know, go through the real deep, 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 deep work. It's just a lifetime dream of mine. Yeah, but no, I same, relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I know I would love to, and in another lifetime, I think I would have. But I think I do, the reason I'm not sure I could is I think there is, there. I, there's definitely this duality yeah. in me and I think both sides need to live and to breathe at the same time. I don't think I can be one, not the other. And I definitely tried it in a way during COVID because yeah. um, so much of my work wasn't wasn't available. Matthew was working so hard all day, every day on supply chains and things like that. But mm. I don't contribute to that mm. side of the company. And there wasn't a huge amount I could do. And I was, you know, at home with my kids all day. And I, I obviously, I loved it and I treasured that time, but I missed feeling dynamic and feeling excited and feeling really purposeful in my work. I really, really missed it. And I noticed I was happier when I, again, had a bit more of that back in my life. So that was an interesting. So I think it's, yeah, and I think it's just learning to be a little bit more. My natural tendency is to be so all or nothing. Mm. You know, something's either a disaster or it's phenomenal. Like it's all over or like it's the best thing ever. And I think it's just gently learning to kind of ride life's roller coaster a little bit better Um, and understand that kind of nothing in life is really finite and and be all and end all like that's why I love reading other people's stories and that's why I first listened one of the reasons I was first listening to your story on, on Elizabeth Day's podcast I think I must have listened to it yeah, probably 2019, because it was after yeah. my daughter was born. It was about a year after she was born that I started to realize, like, I need to start to understand myself a little bit better. I'd never done therapy, but I knew I wasn't very happy. Mm. I knew it's not that I didn't enjoy my life, but I really wasn't very happy. I didn't have this, like, resting sense of ease. Like, nothing felt easy. Everything felt really hard. And it was when she was born... I, that kind of really came to a head and I realized I needed to kind of get to understand myself a little bit better. Um, and it, anyways, and it was, it was, yeah, there's something wildly inspiring about other people's stories of extraordinary hardship, but then seeing people have positives the other side of it and realizing that like, yeah, catastrophizing everything isn't necessarily <laughs> it's the, not at all. It's the part, answer to life. It's part of the video game. The video game has to be, uh, uh, challenging in a way. I, I, I also see a very clear duality in you, if you don't mind me saying. No, you're, not at all. You're, you're, you're an ultimate introvert and your job is out oh, there. Oh, I could like go and live with my husband and my kids and never speak to anybody else the rest of my life and, and genuinely be really happy. 
which I don't think is like normal as such. No, no, ask me. It's very normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would go further. Actually, I would go. I could. I would go be very, completely alone yeah. for. Yeah. I mean, but 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 your job is so in the spotlight. You're like you're. Uh, constantly in front of cameras and I'm, I, I don't know if you've noticed but as we started our conversation you were that uh, shy introvert now you're connected a lot more uh, you know but you're definitely not the kind of person if I am correct to, to say that would feel comfortable in a party with 15 people everyone Oh, it's like my. Did you see your face? Like, you were like, <laughs> no, <laughs> don't make me do it. No, not at all. Exactly, which I think is always a bit surprising to people because I am happy to stand up and talk to three thousand people. And you do frequently. Yeah, which yeah. is a really, yeah. Again, it's just like a bizarre duality. But I think yeah. so many people probably feel that, and you feel like you're consistently trying to reconcile these parts of yourself. And so how what do you do about it? I think you just have to be infinitely more accepting of yourself. Mm. Um. I think that's been my experience is, is learning to understand myself a lot better, but learning to be so much more accepting and gentle. gentle and understanding of it, you know, and that has been so powerful in becoming, yes, infinitely happier and finding life infinitely easier is not, you know, realizing you might have a week where you're mostly one or you're mostly the other, but that doesn't mean that you're stuck in that place forever or that that's how it always goes and I think my my brain is very quick to latch on to to danger essentially I think I've spent most of my childhood in in a kind of fight or flight mode and feeling like a very activated nervous system and so I think my default is to to go to the worst case scenario and to kind of play that out and catastrophize it and so I think I get very stuck very quickly. And so when something's bad, I think it's awful. (laughs) And then when something's good, I think it's the best thing ever. And again, my husband's told me a lot. He's very, he's a very effective mirror. And he'll be the first person to say, like, I can see you going. Like, I can see you sinking into a place where you'll be quite stuck. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm like, just, it's really interesting, actually, I'll tell you, because I'll be like, sometimes I'll just say, like, I don't want to hear it. Like, please just be nice to me. And he's like, this is me being nice to you. Uh like it is me being nice to you and it's really interesting but i think again you have to have a better relationship with yourself to be able to hear that yeah this is me being nice to you i'll borrow this yeah because i think it is it often is and i think sometimes that like loving but like tougher firmer approach of like i know this you know i can see you when you can't see you and i think this is what you probably need and it's it's really do you do the same for him he doesn't need that, which I used to find really difficult. He is the most wildly balanced person. He has, he doesn't swing. Like I'm such a pendulum and I swing so much and, and he just doesn't. He has this resting sense of calm and of ease that his whole family had. And the first time I went to stay with them, I found it really almost confronting. Like because I had never really been consistently happy or content I had always felt kind of this wrestling and unease and they had it in such abundance and it was equal parts kind of very inspiring and very difficult to see and and his his mum died in 2018 but in 2017 she she was diagnosed with a brain tumor and so it would have been, I think it was two weeks after everything had happened and we were at their house um, in the countryside and it was a really beautiful day. It was like early summer and it was it was such a beautiful day. Um, so sunny and just, yeah, you know, England is glorious at that time of year. It's like cow parsley everywhere and it's so green and luscious and um, my niece was about 10 weeks old, I think, and... We were all in the garden, him and his sister, his sister's partner, their, their daughter um, and, and his parents. And this was after, like literally like two days after understanding that it was a brain tumour, it was a cancerous brain tumour and the life expectancy is, is under a year. And there isn't really any treatment fundamentally. Um, and so there's nothing really that could be done. There was going to be a surgery, but like there wasn't going to be able to be much else. And we sat in the garden and she said at the end of the day, like, gosh, that was just a perfect day, wasn't it? And she really meant it. And it was a perfect day. It was like everybody she loved outside 
in a beautiful garden, having a lovely lunch. Like, it was a perfect day, but I couldn't see it. Like, I could only see how bad it was. Mm. And it was just one of those, you know, you have those moments in your life that really kind of wake you up or change your thinking or change your trajectory. And it was really one of those moments where I was like, I just keep seeing... That what's wrong. Yeah, what's wrong. And I keep seeing things in such a binary way like I can't I, I really was struggling to see the nuance like to see the present to see the middle ground I was just like but what about this news you know and I couldn't I, I just couldn't see today mm. and yeah I think that and then kind of realizing that over that year and then um because she was so much able to see the present and see the beauty in the present and, and I never was and that was a real wake-up call to I feel like essentially living your life in the wrong way. Like, that's just not going to make you happy. And then it was, yeah, after my daughter was born, really realising, like, actually how... Blessed. And, yeah, but but yet, like, unable to see it, I was. And so it was, um, yeah, quite a journey of, of accepting. And I think, to, to circle back, I think realising when you have got these, like, interesting parts of, of yourself that don't necessarily always add up or you love your job, but it... You know, it's different to your, how your family think, whatever else. I think but lots of people experience it in different ways. And I think it was just realizing that's okay. Like, it doesn't need to be one thing or the other. We don't need to define it. It doesn't need to be how it is now forever. I will end here. <laughs> I actually think this was so profound and you're so wonderful. You truly are. I don't think people may catch that on camera. But there are moments where you light up completely when you're speaking. And those are the moments when you're inward searching, really getting deeply in touch with yourself. I think that's why I'd love to go and be a monk. <laughs> go <laughs> oh, yeah. follow, go follow Kelong and uh, yeah. But that's an incredible ability, even though sometimes in there it's not comfortable. I yes. That's remarkable about you, honestly. It was so uncomfortable to start with. And yeah. I would say that to anybody who feels like, they need to do that journey of like getting to know themselves and like understanding their, their inner landscape better. I think it was, it was so uncomfortable to start with, just so uncomfortable. There's just so many things I just did not like about myself at all. And, you know, my husband said it to me when we started working together, he was like, you know, as delicious CLA, you're like projecting this, like this life. And yet you don't really seem like you feel it in at all, really. It, like genuinely mm. and um yeah it was wildly difficult but the best kind of discovery i've ever done well i will tell you i have been very inspired honestly i'm not easily inspired i'll tell you that very openly and Thank i you. and i and i work with so many of the top 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 talents in the world that doing what you so instinctively are seeking it's so beautiful really and i'm the way you speak about Matthew, the way you realize the, the, the beautiful parts of yourself and the parts that you're not yet able to accept. And I've watched a lot of your conversations. Yeah, I'm a stalker like that. But I, ha I have to say, sitting in front of you, there is that beautiful soul search. It's really quite inspiring. I'm very grateful I spent this time with you. Oh, thank you. It's very kind. And I don't know if you guys will feel it the same way I felt it, but uh, there is a tiny little monk in there. Uh, a very serious one, I have to admit. And uh, a beautiful journey in every possible way. Uh, that mix of fragility and resilience is just so inspiring. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I loved this conversation. I hope you loved it too. I hope you will actually take the time to uh, listen to it again. I think it is one of those conversations where they are, again, littered with gold nuggets that you, that are hidden in simple words. But uh, if you try to place yourself in the emotional place of this an incredible young soul, uh, you will feel uh, what I felt here. Uh, and yes, uh, as I always tell you, I'm really grateful that you give me the time and the opportunity to invite people that I'd uh, be honored to spend time with. And then they say yes, because Lomo is doing so well. Uh, so they come and spend the time with me. It's all because of you listening. I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, share this with others. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, and uh, take note of those experiments and experiences and bring them into your life. And yes, take a little bit of time to be a monk, uh, even if it's an hour a day, uh, because it doesn't matter how busy you are today, there's always a little bit of time to slow down. I love you all for listening, and I will see you next time.